Presenting to you House Bill 2127. Uh, in some of this term, the bill prohibits a person from knowingly transporting a minor across the state line without, with the intent that such minor obtain an abortion without the consent of the minor's parent or guardian. Uh, there was a fiscal note, I think a superhero Cole passed it out. And basically, it is not my intent to make a felon of these people, but basically that they communicate. In the state of Missouri, you cannot get abortion without consent. In Illinois, it's basically no education. Where this came about was, it was approximately a year ago today, I received a phone call from someone that was at the clinic, or a clinic in Illinois. Uh, the mother was at the front door of the clinic. They would not let her in. She was notified that her daughter was inside, but because they don't have to have consent, they went through the procedure. Uh, and inquiring to uh, anybody and everybody I could get a hold of within a one hour period, so that's all the time we had to work with. They basically said, there's nothing we can do. And so, except for, they could bring them with a civil suit, which basically nothing would come about. So what this does is it could make it into a felon or a felony, in which case, had they done the same and went to those people, the situation was, there was a young uh, lady and her boyfriend. Uh, she got pregnant. The boyfriend's mother took the child across the state line to Illinois to get the abortion. The mother was notified uh, but did not give her consent. And because of that, she could not go inside to be with our daughter during the procedure. So it doesn't really change the law, but it basically lets the parent maybe have a say uh, in some of this. Uh, the gentleman that was with her said that there was 35 cars in the parking lot up to 3520 at Missouri Plates. And so uh, the uh, physical note, I would hope to be zero because I'm not trying to make, I don't think they're violent offenders, but I think it would open up some communication with the parents that a situation like that arose again to where uh, and with the fiscal note basically is part of the <laughs> that have to do with incarcerating somebody that you commit that felony. So given that, uh, I'll open it up to questions. All right, thank you for that presentation of the bill. Are there questions? Questions from the committee? Seeing none. Edwin, do you have witnesses you'd like to call? I think there's one or two. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Susan Klein, representing Missouri Right to Life. 
going to go on record in support of House Bill 2127. Um, 2127 just expands on laws that we currently have in statute to ensure that somebody is not taking a minor girl across state lines to, to get an abortion. Obviously, this is important whenever you look at uh, the issue that you've also heard on the human trafficking issue. Uh, a side effect of that would be that if somebody's getting one of these minor girls pregnant and taking them across state lines, um, then they're uh, evading law in several different areas. So we just want to uh, just make sure that we're covering this issue and that the parents are involved. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Thank you. Be sure and leave a witness for me. Others in favor? Madam Chair, members of the committee, Samuel Lee with Campaign Life Missouri. We want to go on record in uh, support of House Bill 2127. I want to thank the sponsor for uh, bringing this to the attention of the committee and to the legislature. This problem of uh, adults taking minors out of state for abortions is a long standing problem. Um, uh, lawmakers, uh, your predecessors dealt with this back in 2005 in a section 188.250, which would be right before this section. The difference between the current law and this proposal here, one of the differences is that this would uh, deal not just with uh, civil lawsuits, but uh, would, would uh, make a criminal matter. Uh, the second uh, uh, difference is that the current law deals with aiding or assisting a minor to obtain an abortion. This deals solely with transporting a minor across the lines. Uh, that 2005 law was challenged uh, in the courts here in Missouri. Uh, it was uh, narrowed, the construction of that statute was narrowed, but upheld by the Missouri Supreme Court. So we have no doubt in our mind uh, that this law is passed by the General Assembly would be upheld in the state courts. I'm happy to answer about any additional questions. Are there any questions for this witness? If not, uh, thank you. <coughs> Anyone else to speak in favor? Mr. Chairman, committee, from the record, Karen Ness with the Missouri Family Network. I choose to live in the state of Missouri, and when I make that choice, I choose to live under the laws of this state. If I don't agree with those laws, I have the option in this nation and this state to come before you to argue uh, that the laws need to be changed. But if someone else lives in the state of Missouri and they decide to go to another state in order to circumvent the laws of the state of Missouri, they have to agree that they have to face the consequences of that. If they empower another individual and they provide the ability for another individual to circumvent law, then they have to answer for that. But certainly, we need to have some type of penalty when someone would take and materially participate in removing a minor not just another adult, but a minor from the state of Missouri, take them to another state in order to circumvent the laws of the state. There needs to be remedies, and this bill provides those remedies. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for this witness? Thank you. Representative, do you have any other testify favor? <laughs> Thank you. Anyone to uh, Thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone testify in opposition? <coughs> Anyone to testify? Thank you. No problem. Good afternoon, representatives. My name is Allison Dreek. Um, I'm the executive director at NARAL Pro Choice Missouri. Um, NARAL stands in opposition to House Bill 2127. This bill forces young women to rely on potentially abusive and dysfunctional parents. Family communication is desirable, and most parents know when their daughters undergo an abortion, even when their involvement is not mandated, mandated by law. Unfortunately, not all young women are in situations where they can communicate openly with their parents. Those who avoid parental involvement in the decision to have an abortion often do so out of fear of abuse, pressure to carry the pregnancy to term, threats of being thrown out of the house, or other negative repercussions. This act imposes its restrictions regardless of a family situation that a young woman may face. It makes it riskier for young women to exercise their 
right to reproductive choice by criminalizing assistance from a trusted relative and friend. The act will force some young women already struggling physically or emotionally with unwanted pregnancies to travel alone. <coughs> Those young women will be deprived of the benefits of a trusted companionship before and after their medical procedure, isolating them from adults who are best able to help them. It will trap minors in a confusing maze of conflicting state law. A young woman who seeks an abortion in a state other than Missouri will be subject to multiple requirements depending on where she seeks the abortion and whether she travels alone. If she travels with assistance, those who assist her may risk criminal and civil liability under one section of the law unless she complies with the laws of both her home state and the state she chooses to travel to. It fails to recognize the importance of other family members and trusted adults in a young woman's life. Some young women have trusted adults, have trusted adults in their lives other than their parents, whom they voluntarily consult in their life decisions. This legislation discourages such helpful relationships, forcing young women to choose between foregoing needed assistance from these adults and exposing them to criminal liability. It ignores geographic and economic realities and flaws in the judicial bypass system. Young women decide to obtain an abortion outside of their state of residence for a variety of reasons, including lack of a nearby abortion provider in their home state. <coughs> Missouri currently only has one. The presence of supportive loved ones in another state. Difficulties in securing a judicial bypass. Recommendations from trusted relatives or friends or for financial reasons. This act requires young men, women to grapple with the laws of two states, regardless of why they cross a state line to obtain an abortion. Furthermore, the act also violates the Constitution by placing an undue burden on a woman's access to abortion, infringing upon constitutionally protected <laughs> rights to equal protection and interstate travel and endangers the health of young women by making it more dangerous for them to engage in constitutionally protected conduct. In each of these ways, this act promotes an anti-choice agenda over teens' well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for this group? Thank you very much. Proceed. So you are against, uh, we're talking about minors here, right? Yes. And you're against uh, the minors, parents or guardians, knowing about them having abortions? It's a constitutionally protected right, no matter what the age of a woman or minor is. Do you think a minor knows the dangers that are inflicted in kids and cousins because of an abortion? The dangers of having an abortion are less than when I had my appendix out in August, and those risks are told to a minor when she seeks um, abortion care from a provider. So I think a parent or guardian should know that a minor, what they're going to be doing, especially on a major medical exam, as far as I'm concerned, as if it is a lie. I'm afraid that you're trying to criminalize another trusted adult, such as a grandmother or an aunt or someone that these minors can trust in when their mother or father may not be the best person and could lead to dangerous repercussions. I, I just uh, I'm trying to uh, look at this in a way that Anything we need to protect with the minor. It may be a constitutional right. We got to realize that we're talking about minors. Yeah, you know, that's really my concern. Well, they have rights too. Any other questions for this witness? Representative Mary, proceed. Adulthood is um, various, and what's the age of, of what is minor cutoff for, for this? 
Is it 21? Is it 18? Is it 18? 18. Okay, I just heard you playing the color of Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? If not, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor? Opposition? <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, of the committee. For the record, Sarah Rossi with the ACLU of Missouri. Uh, Allison kind of stole my thunder with all the information she just provided to you. Um, I would echo her concerns about the bill. And to address very quickly the question that was just asked of her, uh, there is already law in Missouri statute to require the consent um, provisions be met before a minor can obtain an abortion, and there's already civil penalties if you don't, um, if you assist a minor in obtaining abortion without that consent. So basically, what this bill does is just criminalizes the same behavior instead of making it civil, a civil penalty. And we have the same concerns as Allison that somebody will be jailed for um, doing what they think is in the best interest of a minor when that minor can't speak to uh, her parents. I also think there are some issues with trying to regulate healthcare services that exist in other states. I don't think Missouri would take kindly to Illinois or another state with more liberal laws trying to usurp their power to decide what's best for their constituents. Um, I think that's about that's about the news of it. Other than the fact, which I I mean I've said it a thousand times in here, I'll say it again. The Supreme Court is currently in the process of deliberating the true intent of Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was not only to consider the impact of abortion regulations, but also to consider the intent. And that intent, when in line with Planned Parenthood v. Casey, is to protect the health and welfare of women. So every time you pass one of these abortion regulations, you have to ask yourself if it actually protects the health and welfare of women, even minor women. And the amount of medical evidence and expert witness or expert evidence that points to the opposite when it comes to blocking a minor from obtaining, obtaining an abortion is going to be what you need to consider and what the courts will consider in the future. So while I appreciate uh, Mr. Lee's testimony, I do not think you should have 100% confidence that this kind of regulation would hold up in court. That's it. Thank you. Representative Meredith, proceed. Thank you. Um, you're an attorney, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I just wanted to check. Because I was reading this, and whoever it is that takes the minor across the line, mm -hmm. um, I suppose it could be anybody, who, who would file charges? Um, I don't have this one in front of me, but I think the minor can. The minor, yes. Thank you, Mother. Yeah, basically, and they don't even have to be part of the, they don't even have to be there during the procedure or be involved in it at all whatsoever. And then they can, I think it says that they can um, bring charges for emotional damages as well. Which... So this could be maybe the presumptive father? Mm -hmm. If it was the presumptive father and this person is a minor, could he be liable for like statutory rape? It depends on the age of the presumptive father. So they would have to be over. I'm not sure what the statutory rape age is in Missouri. For example, if it was a 14 year old girl who was seeking an abortion and the person who pregnant her was 14, I'm not. I don't think that counts as statutory rape, for example. But I mean, yes, if they were worried about if it was an older an older man and the the girl seeking the abortion was underage, that would be something that person would have to consider in in making a criminal complaint. That's I mean, it just occurred to me. You have a 17 year old young woman who is pregnant, somebody takes her across the line, and the 24 year old father goes, Wait a minute, that's my baby. So I was just curious. Yeah. I think there's, there should also be some consideration for the fact that a, when a minor girl is seeking an abortion, is probably traumatic enough, and asking her to be a witness in a criminal trial for, some, for something that she wanted to happen is uh, pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Newman, proceed. Yeah, to inquire, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Rossi, for you know the uh, ex explanation, particularly of the constitutional issues, you know, potentially with this. Um, you mentioned a lot about the the safety and welfare of a woman, regardless of age. 
Is there any medical group that uh, agrees with this? Any um, medical association, basically medical groups that actually represent medical people? Yes, there are uh, quite a few of them. I'm the wrong person to ask that question of. I think you could probably uh, inquire if Play Parent has already wrong. They would have a better list for you. They usually have it memorized. I don't have it memorized. <laughs> well, would you, um, well, I guess maybe phrase it differently. Do you know of any medical association, any medical group that actually is in favor of this? No. So again, if we're really talking about being concerned about the safety and welfare of a woman, regardless of age, I mean, we should be listening to medical professionals. Think that that medical professional would be able to, you know, influence us or, or weigh in. Therefore, you hope so. Uh, if that's not the case, and then there are other considerations, I believe, that <laughs> are really behind the intent of this, and it's really not the, like you mentioned, the safety, and health, and welfare of, of women. Right. I mean, I know the American Academy of Pediatrics is opposed to bills like these. I've never in my uh, seven years of advocating for reproductive rights seen a pediatrician come in favor of a bill like this. That's what I was wondering. There we hardly ever have any medical professionals actually testifying in favor of these this type of legislation. Right. So I think that's really important to remember as you brought up the what's potentially um, in front of us in terms of a, another Supreme Court decision and how if we're going to keep talking about the safety and health of women were completely really not. Right. And the, the kind of the track of, of I've talked about this before, but kind of the track of abortion jurisprudence. I mean, I think courts have started to recognize that we've hit rock bottom in the amount of these regulations that have passed state legislatures and how damaging they've become. And now it's kind of on its upswing where um, district courts, United States district courts are saying, listen, we're done with this. We have to start actually thinking about not just how this actually impacts women, but what the intent of this legislation is. And if it's supposed to actually be to help women, then it has to be proven that it helps helps women. And that's that's the conversation that's happening right now. And there's no proof that it feels like this help women at all. Well, and I guess if you look at this in terms of other medical procedures, is there other penalties that we know of in statute that penalizes people for crossing the state line for a medical procedure? I don't think so. So this is just be pointing out this one, if this right. would become a statute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative. Representative Payton, proceed. Um, you know, we keep talking about women's health and women's rights and things, but we're talking about minors here. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that, say, in the court of law, there's a differentiation between an adult and a minor? And just any in general. Well. I guess when it comes to my area of expertise, that's constitutional rights, and the constitutional rights of a minor are equal to that of an adult. I mean, there are there are um, benchmarks that a minor has to hit to access rights sometimes, like the right to vote. Um, but that's a right that they have from birth on. They just don't access it till they're 18. The United States Supreme Court has been very clear that minor girls have the same rights as adult women when it comes to accessing reproductive health care. They've been very clear that carrying a pregnancy to term is a minor's right. And it's very clear that not carrying a pregnancy to term is a minor's right, just as, as it is for an adult. Um, I think it's important to keep the focus of this bill. We're talking about minors here, and the, mm -hmm. and, and the, and the, the, the justice system in general is very protective of children. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that this bill is talking about children, <laughs> not women in general. And you know, you brought an interesting scenario to life that if there were a 24-year-old man that impregnated a 14-year-old girl, and that father of that child decided to take this child across the state line, mm -hmm. I have a real problem with that because it's a child. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that that's what we're focusing on here is children, not the generality mm -hmm. of women. Absolutely, Representative. And I actually, I used to work for a domestic and sexual violence organization, so I'm very sensitive to that. I think that the important thing to remember in the context of this, it is about, I understand that protecting minors is very important to you, and I understand it's important to the committee. But I think what we need to remember is that every organization that has expertise in the field of healthcare for minors is opposed to these bills because they find that it actually harms minors more than helps them. So if you're really, if you're really truly interested in keeping minors as safe as possible, experiencing the least amount of physical harm and damage as possible, emotional trauma, mental trauma, 
then you should vote no on bills like this because every single medical organization that has any credence in this in the country has said that preventing minors from attaining abortion services, especially in cases of abuse and rape and incest, is much worse for them um, than forcing them to jump through all these hurdles to be able to access the care they need. So I, I get that you want to protect minors, but this is not protecting minors, it's actually harming them. Well, I think that generality probably doesn't hold true for a lot of minors who seek abortions. And, and there's a reason, physiological reasons, in brain development and judgment and all that, why we protect children. Thank you. Representative Reynolds, proceed. This is my longest round, I think. <laughs> the record setter. Uh, you talk about studies and facts mm -hmm. that have proven this. Is there any way you can give us some of that? Yeah, absolutely. We can we can send it to you. Uh, you know, I I'd say we can probably get some. I shouldn't I shouldn't assume. You guys we can get that the studies and opposition, et cetera. Yep. Because uh, you know, I, I hear stories of people that uh, on the psych psychiatric wards of people that have had abortions more than one and the emotional problems that they're going through now after they've had an abortion, what they deal with. And it, it hasn't been good for them. And it's, it's affected their life. Uh, and, and they were they wish they would have had. So, I mean, it's not <laughs> all a good thing. Like, you know, so I, I just think we, I kind of like what she was talking about, generalities, you know, this is a good thing, this is a bad thing. But uh, I, I just, you know, when we look at what life is, these are lives. I know that we differ there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> to me, it's just common sense. But at the same time, there is emotional trauma, especially when we talk about minors that have an abortion. They can be affected. They may be physically uh, uh, affected as well, but mm -hmm. mentally, you got to be thinking about the emotional part of it mm -hmm. to that side as well. But I would like to have some yeah. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in opposition? Anyone to speak? Hi, for the record, Megan, the Director of Policy and Organizing with Planned Parenthood Advocates in Missouri, and we represent the Planned Parenthood affiliates in the state who provide uh, preventive care, including um, annual exams, STI testing and treatment, cancer testing and treatment, breast exams to approximately 50,000 Missourians across the year, across a uh, year across the state, and uh, we also provide abortion care. Um, I want to go on record in opposition to House Bill 2127, um, and actually just address some of the things that have questions that have been raised in previous testimony. I think um, the opposition testimony has been clear and very helpful. Um, I I've said this before this committee before. <laughs> I, I think what unites us in this room is um, care and compassion for children and families. And I think at the forefront, we all want teens to be healthy and safe. And as uh, Sarah Rossi with the ACLU mentioned, it is the medical expertise that um, inappropriate date intrusion and in family decision making um, does not keep teens healthy and safe and puts teens in scenarios I know you know about because you hear about uh, families torn apart a lot in this committee and those situations it can put them in danger and also puts a barrier between a minor and very important health care. The medical associations that oppose inappropriate state intrusion and family decision making include the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Public Health Association, and again um, we can uh, share their research with you, um, which says they delay access to services um, and force some teens to take measures into their own hands. Um, just to reiterate, although I feel you have a, a very um, a good purview about how not all teens come from 
families where good communication is possible. I think you hear about that all the time in this committee. And this bill actually just gets between minors and the health care they need. Um, I think there are alternate uh, policies that the committee and the state could be focused on. I've mentioned them before. Um, actually, comprehensive sex education in schools demonstrates to increase family communication about these sensitive issues. Um, and so uh, focusing on those policy measures could actually while not intruding on access to health care, could promote the health and safety of minors. And then to specifically mention the question about um, abortion is a very, very safe medical procedure. It's clearly safer than the alternative of um, childbirth. And when we're talking about minors, that is what we're talking about, that they face the same um, consequence of pregnancy, the same options as a, an adult. You can either terminate a pregnancy Give it, have, go continue the pregnancy, have birth, give it up for adoption, or keep it. So the alternatives are at much higher safety risk for that minor should she decide to take the abortion. And then there have been um, one very notable um, body of research into the emotional impact of abortion. It was actually a commission formed under President Reagan, headed up by Surgeon General C. Everett Koop that was specifically charged with documenting <laughs> all of the medical research related to emotional harm um, uh, and abortion. That committee found no credible evidence that there was documented um, uh, condition or high risk associated with abortion related to emotional um, trauma that is very, very well documented. There's actually quite a bit of litigation and um, public relations around the fact that the Reagan administration didn't want the research from this committee that found that there was no evidence released to the public and ultimately it had to be released. So that has been very, very well documented and um, per your request to Sarah Rossi, we, we can follow up with the data on that. So uh, in closing, I just want to reiterate our, our opposition and, and plead with the committee to focus on other policy solutions um, that will help keep teens healthy and safe. Thank you. Representative Newman. To acquire Mr. Chair. Proceed, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Me. Uh, I want to ask you the same question because since you're maybe coming more from, from the healthcare um, side of this, is there any other medical procedures that have a similar um, restrictions on taking a minor across the state line for a medical procedure that would require some of the same things? There are none that I'm aware of, and I'm glad you brought that out, the notion of singling out access to reproductive health care. I, I, I meant to start by saying I, I, I hear the concern about abortion coming from the members of this committee, and I understand that we um, disagree fundamentally on whether a woman should have this decision at any age. That that's not what this bill is doing. This bill is singling out abortion and minors for a major escalation in state law, criminalizing, as uh, Allison said, a grandmother and on a trusted adult who's trying to help a minor who's facing potential harm um, due to her pregnancy. So again, if if a, a minor in whatever type of family situation needed a operation or wanted an operation, even. Um, and cross the state line to do it, we don't put those same restrictions. We only talk about this medical procedure, but none other. And yet there's tons of, I think, medical procedures that I think all parents would, or family members would like to be involved in. And yet I'm, I'm not aware, too, in terms of state statute, that we are concerned about any other procedures. Correct. I think that the mandate is uh, reg reg regulated regulated to this uh, procedure of respective health care. And then this goes the next step in terms of actually criminalizing anyone who would be assisting for whatever reason. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Do you uh, know the cost of an abortion? And how's that paid for? Is that generally a cash or is it uh, down through insurance? Could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, current Missouri state law prohibits um, state-issued or uh, state-controlled insurance policies from covering abortion. Um, so unless you're in an abortion or excuse me, in an insurance plan that is governed by ERISA, which is federal oversight, the, the insurance is prohibited from covering it um, under very limited circumstances. I believe there might be a life exception in that, but I would have to check on that. And prices vary. So it's, it may be pretty much a cash 
operation. Is that correct? On uh, getting an abortion? Uh, the method of payment could vary also. Okay. <coughs> All right. But, you. but you're correct that insurance doesn't cover it because you passed a law to prohibit that. Perfect. Anyone else just have any questions for this witness? Again. You said uh, to inquire. You said uh, price varies. Can you give us a ballpark figure? I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't want to get it wrong. Okay. Thank you, Representative Haver. Can you name any medical procedures that someone who's not a guardian or a, a legal guardian or a parent can take a child across the state line? without having permission from that parent or legal guardian where a procedure could be performed like dental work or is there anything other than abortion that um, doesn't need parental or guardian uh, permission for a minor well let's be clear that Missouri law does require that uh, minor has the consent of one parent prior to accessing abortion in Missouri that's that's yeah, in law we were just having a conversation about other medical procedures right. is there another medical procedure where a parent or guardian is not involved whether it's in Missouri or across the state line that you know of I know of no regulation in Missouri statute that regulates other procedures so I can't so of course yes there are people who could cross state lines to access other medical services um, I don't know. I'm thinking about guardian has to agree to it. That uh, I I I I think what you're asking is what would happen if a minor needed dental work and someone took them across the state line to get dental work and I don't I know of no regulation that would criminalize the person taking them over in the way that is proposed in this bill. I have never. any of my children anywhere for any kind of medical procedure where I didn't have to sign as a parent or guardian to allow the procedure I can't imagine that um, this is just because you know, there has to be some regulation or some purpose for why a parent or a guardian must sign for other medical procedures I just want to make that point you're saying it's the only one that we're going to try and regulate but you know, I can't imagine any medical profession or doing anything on a minor without the consent of their parents. There's actually a lot of medical research when it comes to reproductive health care and access to it that demonstrates that trying to block access causes more harm than good. In this specific realm of health care where um, access to it is um, needs to be provided in a confidential um, and, and time sensitive um, situation. So I, I think what you're you're pointing out is that in this area, and, and the ACLU had often points this out that the highest court in the land have recognized that accessing reproductive health services, particularly abortion, rises to the level of a constitutional right and does need to be protected, particularly because it's such a um, uh, politicized uh, and regulated procedure that protections need to be put in place specifically for this procedure because of the constitutional right involved with it because it is a profound um, and important decision and I think it's clear we disagree on whether or not the pregnant person has the right to decide what to do in this situation. That's not the discussion I'm having now. I'm just talking about parental rights and, and guardians and who has to agree with procedures and I just want to make one more comment that um, relying on 40-year-old data from the Reagan administration saying that there's no emotional impact from abortion, I just I just strongly um, question the validity of that. Thank you. Point taken, we'll get more uh, updated research. It just was a, a very major and comprehensive um, body of research that I thought people might have been familiar with from the, how much it was in the news. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions for this witness? Not, uh, anyone here to, uh, for informational purposes? If not, I'm going to turn this over to the Madam Chair. Thank you.
representative Hurst, do you have any closing comments? Uh, I think I've taken enough of your time, and I think, I mean, I would have brought the bill forward if I didn't have uh, some concern about it as a parent of a teenager, and a soon to be another teenager, daughters, and a teenage son. Uh, and whenever I got the phone call from the lady in Illinois, uh, she does not have a grandchild, though. No. So, uh, given that, I think there are issues there. Whether or not there's any surveys done, it will have an impact on people. And so, I appreciate you and Wendy listening to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the hearing on House Bill 2127. Representative Rader. Representative Rader is bringing House Bill 2384 and 2580. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. Um, and I'll give just a short story to explain why we're, why we're doing two bills. Myself and Senator Wallingford share some constituents. He calls it called these bills the Channel 12 bills and that's because um, our we have a, a constituent, shared constituent, whose children wanted to take care of this elderly lady and there were multiple children fussing over who was going to take care of, of the mom. And um, so one of, the, one of the daughters had the mom and um, because of some disagreements and some and someone calling the hotline, the department went and said, "Hey, we understand that, that the living facilities are not proper. We need to move your mom to a nursing facility." The department got a hold of the uh, administrator, county administrator, who went to the judge, got the order signed, and, and the lady was the elderly lady was moved to a nursing home. And so, based on this, Senator Longford and I started looking into it deeper and seeing that there were some other issues across the state um, and, and across the United States, actually, our, our administrative laws are, are pretty antiquated. And so, um, Senator Longford had, had done some research, and a few years ago, there some of the similar problems with removing children from a home. and. Um, so one of the things that they did that really helped with this is when the department goes to the door, they give a written, and, and so this is the uh, House of 2384, the department's required to give something in writing, letting that family know why they're there, what their rights are, because when you get a knock on the door from the department saying, we, you know, we told your, your home is unfit and, and Perhaps the words aren't quite the way as they should be, and so then it's you know the, the people taking care of the elderly parent get all upset, and they don't really know that well it's a process to go through, and you can't actually just come and remove my mother. And, um, so we thought that providing written materials upon showing up to investigate is very important, just the, the department's policy. And that helped several years ago with the, the children's uh, division. And so that's the 2384. And it's the same as Senate Bill 619. And the Senate did pass that out today. So that's coming our way as well. And then the companion bill for that is House Bill 2580. And he has a Senate bill as well, uh, 1083. And this is just a phase two of that. So the, this is saying you have to give written notification of what that family uh, rights are regarding the removal of your elderly parent or whomever. Phase two of this is the second bill, which says that if you're going, if the department is going to say the living conditions are unfit, where where someone where I might think something's unfit, someone else might not. And so we're requiring a second signature by the, the health and senior services to go and investigate. And instead of just having one signing off and saying, yes, this place is unfit, you would have the health and senior services go in and investigate as well and say, well, yes, it is unfit and, and the elderly person needs to be removed. Fit in the nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Representative Hayford, you may. 
Somebody has the department had any uh, input on this legislation or any comments about it? I know that Senator Wallenberg did have conversations with the department, and I'm think we have folks from the department here today, um, so they could an answer that better. Okay. Um, Other questions from the state? Do you have witnesses that you <coughs> can to speak? No. no. Let me see. Um, is there anyone here that is in support of the bill that would like to speak? Is there anyone here in opposition of the bill who would like to speak? Both bills. We'll do both of them. Is there anyone here for informational purposes only? The department is here if uh, Representative wants us to come up and, and answer questions, but if not, we might not testify. We can, if there are questions else. Is there are questions. Representative Meredith, do you have a question? Would you like the department to come forward? Sure. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at 2384 in section two, it's on the first page, and I guess I was presuming that the persons living with the elderly person are not, they're, okay, yes, and then that, that they're being cared for by a family member. Okay, well, being cared for by a family member can mean a couple of different things, such as like elderly parents who need help. Um, Sometimes it means that a person lives with the elderly parent, and sometimes it means that the, the, the caregiver, I suppose, is coming by to visit, and they're you know they're taking care of the money, they're making sure there's groceries there, and they see themselves as the caregiver. So there's a couple of different definitions here. Probably it is. That's a great question, and, and maybe you could explain to me what the what the difference would be in whether they get the um, written notification. The family that this happened to, their mother was actually living with with the, the daughter. Because sometimes in their home, they're not. They're not like this. Who would like to know what I'm talking about? <laughs> mm, I have another thought. I don't know if I have a response directly to, to what you're suggesting. Uh, Stephen Allen the Department of Health and Senior Services Liaison. Um, a few points that may be of, of use to the committee is that one, uh, and I have Celeste Hargraves here, so if I mess up, she'll come up and correct me. She's the director of our senior disability services. Uh, but the department currently does not have the ability or the authority to um, unilaterally, unilaterally take anyone out of their home. Um, we normally go out and then we and conduct our investigations, but if we see uh, you know, some very bad things, we have to call law enforcement and have them come and do that. That removal process. So we'd actually are not a custodial department in that regard. Um, that's not responsive to your particular question. You were, let me just make sure I, I'm being responsive in terms of who the target audience is here. Is that what your question is? Well, if, 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 yes. say the department here is the person um, who's not getting care that they need, and they go to visit this person, and this person is living alone. And the person who is the caregiver, the person who brings food, the person who brings whatever, doesn't happen to be there at the time, and they're the person who is supposedly responsible. So, yeah, so I, I think maybe what how I would be responsive there is that hotlines, like the entire investigative process, is much broader than that. Like we investigate folks who are living by themselves, we investigate people who are living, um, you know, potentially with. Uh, their, their children and nurse and et cetera. So whenever a hotline occurs, you go out and investigate that process. Okay. Well, in some situations, so if someone were by themselves, um, by themselves, pardon me, and they were unsafe, and we went out and found out that they were unsafe, I think that in that case, then we would try to make sure that they got the resources that they needed. So if they were, um, a sound mind, you know, if they were making choices and they were uh, completely independent, I think they would be probably allowed to stay, but if they were not staying, then we would take, you know, um, take a path forward to try to make sure that they get to take the resources that they need. Does that make sense? So if they're by themselves and they're completely independent <coughs> and they are, are the right mind, then we probably would take an action there. But if they are by themselves and not getting the need they need or getting the help that they need, 
we would try to make sure that to connect them with those resources. Okay, so that's I'm you know I'm looking at this and this looks like if they're living if somebody's living in the home with them, this is really cool. But if they're not, and that's what and this bill talks about giving that written notification to the person to the person in the hotline to between whom is not caring for that person properly. I'm, I'm caretaker. Thank you. Representative Hager, did you have a just a general word that the department had on this question? We don't have an official position for or against, uh, but the concern here is that uh, you know when we go out, we want to just make sure that those individual people are safe, and that's our main goal is to make sure they're safe, make sure they have resources. Um, and as you can imagine, if the first thing that occurs when we knock on the door is to give them a sheet of paper that says you have the right to an attorney, and you know it's just like lay, laying all of that out. And potentially that will impede our ability to make sure that individual is safe. So um, an example, a glitch will just let me know, um, is if I knock on the door and let's say uh, I'm the son or someone is the son and they have their mom or dad living with them and that's the alleged perpetrator and mom and dad is back in the corner and we're talking to that individual and we say, hey, well, we're here to investigate your right to attorney, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They may shut the door on us right then and there, we may not even be able to get into the home to speak to that, that, that eligible adult or, or the person that we're trying to make sure is safe. And so that's really the concern that, you know, the rights necessarily isn't a bad thing to let people know, but that handing the, you know, the, the sheet of paper saying, hey, we're here, here's, you know, everything that we can do, here's the process may impede um, our ability to conduct uh, these investigations. Yes, yeah, so Thank you. So, is there any um, way you think we can reconcile the intent of this bill and process? Do you have any suggestions? Or is that something we maybe need to work on? Potentially. Because I think the intent of the bill is, it, it, is good. Yeah. It's just how do we make the process work for everyone? Right. I think there may be some areas that we can work on. Like, I don't know if like getting it all online, the process, or you know, saying, you know, here is the entire process. You know, if you have questions, feel free to look at our website. And at this point, I'm fairly certain our folks would explain that process as asked. So I think the process is what we would have to work on is determining what would work for both um, the senator and the representative and the department. Because I know they, the, the representative and the senator don't want to impede other abuse investigations. Like, we understand that. Um, but just try to find out where we can kind of fit together to make sure we're not impeding those. We're also um, making sure individuals. And I have to ask, do you anticipate a fiscal note? <coughs> it came back now. Zero. Okay. And both bills. And, um, and, and if I may add, the first one with the written notification, it is also it does also require to have it on the department's website, which it may already be there. All right. Be sure to be with us for Thank you. All right, let's see, do last, I think our last category was um, for informational purposes only. Is there anyone else? All right. Any closing comments? I just appreciate you guys doing both these work. I know we're late in the session, and um, but good news is this is the first one that's come out of the Senate, so perhaps we can get something done. All right. Thank you very much. So that closes the hearing on House Bill 2580 and 2384. All right. Now we need to do executive session. Go ahead and um, pick up to the stack. Um, House Bill 2558. You want to recap that for us, Representative, and talk about the amendment. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Right, before you do that, I've got to do this. I move that House Bill 2558 be passed. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Members of the committee, uh, for the record, Charles McCarty, uh, Robertson Jefferson, St. Louis County. 2558 is a bill you heard uh, a couple of weeks ago that dealt with uh, pros of cancer and embryos uh, and their disposition at time of divorce or separation or death. Um, many times these uh, cases have 
agreements, uh, well, in all cases, they have agreements uh, when they go into this uh, arrangement uh, that they sign. And then when something happens and they actually go through a divorce, uh, the court is left with a problem. Uh, because uh, if, the, if the parties uh, agree to remain in the agreement that they have, then that's fine. If they disagree, then the court has really no direction as to what they are to do because they, uh, the law says that uh, the best interest of uh, a child is uh, joint custody. And you cannot uh, force someone to be a parent which we heard in a committee meeting. And so the bill actually just allows them to have some discretion and some direction in that. Uh, so if there's, a, if there's a disagreement and one of the parents wants to keep the embryos, it gives the courts the opportunity to grant the custody of those embryos to that person, uh, be it the husband or the wife. And um, it also allows the other party to be free from any responsibility or obligation. Uh, you do have an amendment in, in front of you that has been previously distributed to O3H, and uh, that that amendment takes out some of the controversial language uh, that we had uh, uh, during the committee. Uh, takes out uh, anything to do with uh, uh, the, the DNA donors. It takes out anything to do with personhood. It takes out all that kind of stuff. It strictly deals with the issue. And we really didn't want to get the issue bogged down in all the other things that are really covered under statute already at this point uh, and really just wanted to focus on that issue and so the the amendment matches the senate bill uh, that senator riddle is handling and uh with that madam Madam Chair, i'm happy to answer any questions are there any questions from the committee all right seeing none i have an amendment it has been distributed and i move for its adoption are there is there any discussion Seeing none. All those in favor of adopting House Committee Amendment Number One, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, signify by saying no. The ayes have it. You have adopted the amendment. So I move that House Bill 2558 be voted to pass with House Committee Amendment Number One. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Right. Please call the roll. Chairman Franklin. Aye. Vice Chair Ewing. Aye. Thank you, Member Mary. Aye. Aye. Representative Mary. Aye. Representative Beard. Representative Bratton. Representative Brown. Representative Gannon. Aye. Representative Hager. Aye. Representative Lauer. Representative Newman? No. Representative Norm? No. Representative Rimley? Yes. By your vote of six ayes and two noes, you have voted House Bill 2558 to pass with committee amendments number one. Thank you, Thank you. All right. Representative Lance. Uh, I move that House Bill 2624 be voted due pass. Twenty six twenty four deals with um, the precedence of orders entered by the juvenile court. The uh, court has to stay involved because uh, one parent isn't ready. To, uh, to have the child reconciled. Uh, the court has to enforce the safety. We need to leave the juvenile court in charge. Uh, this allows the court to place the child with the responsible parent. And prior testing, you know, apply in this case. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Franklin. Aye. Vice Chair Newman. Aye. Ranking Member Mary. Aye. Representative Beard. Representative Bratton. Representative Brown. Representative Gannon. Aye. Representative Hayter. Aye. Representative Lauer. Representative Newman. Aye. Representative North. Aye. Representative Rimley. 
Everybody voted eight ayes and zero no's. You have voted House Bill 2624 to pass. Right, thank you. I move that Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 688 and 854 be do pass. Is there any discussion? I have an amendment, it has been distributed, and I move for its adoption. Um, the companion bill, our committee has heard the companion house bill for this. So uh, what we're doing is just making the two bills identical and uh, changing a little bit of the language uh, to bring it uh, into the terms that need to be reflected in the bill. Any discussion? All those in favor of adopting the House Committee Amendment Number One, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed by saying no. The ayes have it. You've adopted the amendment. I move that. Okay. Yeah. All right, I move that okay, okay. Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 688 and 854 be due passed with the House Committee Amendment number one. Is there any discussion? Please call the roll. Chairwoman Franklin. Aye. Vice Chair Dewey. Aye. Ranking Member Mary. Representative Beard, Representative Bratton, Representative Brown, Representative Gannon. Aye. Representative Hayter. Aye. Representative Lauer. Representative Newman. No. Representative North. No. Representative Ramon. Yes. Yeah. By your vote, as six ayes and two noes, you have voted Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 688 and 854. You passed the House. Committee amendments number one. Good. All right. Children and families for today. Oh, I'm sorry. We got one more vote to do. We're ready to go. Uh, okay. Here we go. I move that House Bill 2492 be voted to pass. Is there any discussion? This is on the uh, kinship relationship and foster care. Representative, or, sorry, Representative Franklin. Aye. Representative Ewing. Aye. Representative Meredith. Representative Beard. Representative Bratton. Representative Brown, Representative Gannon, Aye. Representative Payton, Aye. Representative Wallace, Representative Newman, Aye. Representative North, Aye. Representative Rimley. All right. By your vote of eight ayes and zero no's, you have voted House Bill 2492 to pass. All right, there we go. Thank you all very much. Children and families, it's a